Welcome to ARMA International's webinar, Legal Tech 2019 Rewind. I'm Nick Inglis. I'm the Executive Director of Content and Programming at ARMA, and I will be your host and moderator for today's webinar, where we're going to be looking back at the innovative information governance track from Legal Tech. In this track, we featured three informative sessions from some of today's top experts in the field, many of whom are joining us on today's webinar. For those who have attained your IGP, the Information Governance Professional Certification, today's webinar counts towards one continuing education credit in the legal category. Slides for today's presentation will be made available in the chat window of this webinar. If you have a question, feel free to ask in the Q&A box of the webinar, although we are unlikely to get to all questions, we will respond to any questions received after the webinar. Before we get started, I want you to consider doing something great for yourself, all while helping support ARMA this year. This is our first webinar of the year, and it's also our first open webinar ever. This is our first time we've started to unlock the vast knowledge of ARMA International for everyone. This is a calculated bet, and I'm betting that when you learn more about what ARMA has to offer, that you're going to want to become an ARMA professional member. So I'm going to ask you to help me help prove me right in just a moment. One of ARMA's best kept secrets is that there's a wealth of resources that have been only available to our professional members. And our members are leveraging their resources. ARMA Pro members continue to say over and over again that they're wildly satisfied with what they're receiving as a professional member. In fact, over 95% of our members say that they would recommend ARMA membership to colleagues. I don't know of any other association that comes even close on that metric. ARMA is on the rise. So I want you to consider doing something great for yourself this year, becoming an ARMA professional member. It's not that expensive and it's worth every single penny. You'll be supporting the incredible programming of ARMA and making it possible for us to do even more for you. When you become a professional member, you're contributing to yourself and your own professional development. I think you're worth it. I know your career is worth it. Your professional development is worth it. And I know you're worth making this investment in yourself. So register as a professional member by going to arma.org and clicking on join, then selecting join as a professional. Go do it and join the ranks of people who are in the know and become an ARMA professional member. I'll remind you again at the end of the webinar. Today's webinar features three of our sessions from the ARMA Innovative Information Governance Track at Legal Tech. In this webinar, we'll be showing a handful of slides from those sessions and sharing some of the insights from our incredible speakers. If you uh, would like to receive more insights, I'd love for you to join us in Nashville this year in October for the ARMA Conference 2019. Pre-registration just opened up for you to take advantage of the lowest rates possible to attend the ARMA Conference. You can register at arma.org slash live. Now the required disclaimer for any and all legal advice. Now I wanna shift gears and introduce our first session look back from Legal Tech. The session was so packed that the people from Legal Tech actually had to bring in extra chairs into the back of the room. So we know that you're gonna appreciate the session. Uh, the first session of the Innovative Information Governance Track was called The Future Is Now, Managing Messaging Data, and it was led by Therese Creparo and Anthony Diana. Today we have with us Anthony Diana. Anthony is the co-head of Reed Smith LLP's Global Intellectual Property, Technology, and Data Group, and is also a member of the Records, eDiscovery, Complex Litigation, and Financial Technology teams. Welcome, Anthony Diana. Thank you. Uh, you spoke about messaging data at Legal Tech. Uh, what would you say are the primary risks of messaging data? Sure, uh, Nick. So one of the things that we discussed at, at, the, at the event was the importance that messaging data um, is in, to most organizations. Um, and it's mostly because of the risks associated with it. Obviously, it continues to be, as this slide shows, uh, really the key source of communication. Um, for organizations, um, even though there's obviously other types of messaging communications that are out there, email still is king. Um, and, and that's something that people have to manage. So the volume is not, in, in, the volume is not decreasing, it's still increasing over and over again. 
Um, and the idea of having, you know, a thousand emails per employee per week is sort of the metric that's out there. Um, most organizations have, have done a really bad job of managing that data. So the emails reside not only going back many years, but off, often all over the place within the organization. Um, and then over time, uh, it's been pretty difficult because people use email in different ways, some of them using it as a records management uh, storage place. Um, so one of the things that we're tracking is there is technology like Microsoft 365 and others that are coming out where the idea is to use that technology to manage, better manage the risks associated with that. Um, the technology is improving, but I think one of the things that we were trying to get across is there's things you can do now um, to start getting you ready for when the technology catches up and you can actually start doing things like not only applying retention, but identifying records um, and really having a workflow that, that manages email. So you're only keeping email that you actually need for legal, regulatory, or business needs. Um, so that's the ultimate goal, and that's where I think it's heading. I'll just go to the next slide. So uh, in terms of risks, um, I mean, I think one of, we've seen all of this. Um, from a compliance and regulatory standpoint, we have seen issues where um, emails disappear um, and they need to be kept for uh, regulatory reasons. Um, not every organization has that difficulty, but many do, uh, particularly those that are um, re highly regulated like financial institutions and pharma. Uh, but we're seeing in other organizations as well, people don't understand that, for example, key records, whether it's HR records or tax records that you may have legal obligation to keep may be stored in your email. So you just have to understand that. Um, privacy, privacy, not surprisingly, has become a huge issue with the GDPR and CCPA, which I know we're gonna be talking about later. Um, that, that is another issue where keeping all your email forever doesn't work under those uh, guidelines. There's a tremendous amount of personal information on email. That's not just the email, you know, the messages itself um, and in the GDPR, your email address and the like could be considered sensitive information, but uh, more importantly, lots of spreadsheets, lots of contracts, lots of other documents with personal information. And if you're going to have a compliant program, you have to deal with email on the privacy side. Um, data breach and cybersecurity is huge. Probably the number one area for, from a security perspective for most organizations is email. We see it in phishing all the time. Um, most, of the, most of the big data breaches you hear about probably have to do with email somewhere or the other. So just understanding um, that if you're gonna have a cybersecurity uh, program or you're dealing with information security generally, you better be protecting your email. And that also means not keeping all your email. Um, and then something that's been going on for years, litigation liability discovery. You know, um, We're getting a lot of calls from CEOs and chairmen of the board who are really upset that the email that's on the front page of the New York Times is something from you know a decade ago and the question is why do we still have it and then why do i have to pay you know a hundred million dollar or a billion dollar settlement because of bad um bad emails that are there and then shouldn't have been there so that's another driver i think in terms of risks and what what would you say are the challenges of managing messaging data um that, yeah look the challenges are uh similar um it, it's that number one i think one of the things is not clear who is in charge of managing email. As I just talked about, we've talked about regulatory requirements you may have. You have cybersecurity, you have data privacy, you have records, you have IT folks. So one of the big challenges is figuring out who is actually responsible for managing messaging data. Um, I can tell you that I don't have an answer to that because most organizations still haven't figured it out. Um, you know, they may get to a point of they say, okay, we want a retention of, you know, seven years, six months, whatever the retention is going to be. But when it comes to who owns it, um, that is still a major challenge because there's a lot of decisions that have to be made. Um, you know, other things to keep in mind in terms of challenges are things like, um, you know, determining, particularly from the business side, who, um, wh what information do they really need in email? Um, and when you start down the road of figuring out whether it's a data migration or whether you're figuring out you know, can I start getting rid of email? There's always gonna be pushback from the business because they always say that they need an email from three years ago. Um, and that may be true, but that's one email out of, you know, millions that are actually accessed. 
Um, so pushing back on um, business is always critical and figuring out where you're going to put those emails. The other thing is it's constantly changing. So you may be upgrading to new, new technology. You may have business transformations where you're doing mergers, acquisitions, and the like. So as soon as you think you solve the problem, a new problem arises. So it's not, I would love to say you could do a program or a project, fix all your email and move on, and that's not the way it works. Um, normally what ends up happening is it's the start and it takes many, many years to sort of figure this out and you're always dealing with something new. Um, so uh, that, that are just some of the challenges that, that you have to deal with. Now, one, of, one of the things that stood out to me in, in your presentation was, was one of the, the phrases that you had utilized. You'd spoken about proportionate but not perfect preservation. Mm -hmm. can, can you talk to that phrasing and why you stated it in that way? Yeah, no, I think it's one of the most important things when you're managing data and legal is often the, the sort of the bad guy here and says, no, we can't get rid of it because we need everything. Um, the reality is, is under the law, um, whether it's the amended rules of federal uh, civil procedure or just generally in the common law, um, the standard is not, I have to keep everything. The standard is, do I have reasonable, did I take reasonable steps to preserve data? And even there, this is where the proportionality comes in, embedded in the federal rules of civil procedure and on the common law is this concept of, you don't have to preserve every little piece of data that may be relevant. Um, it's really coming back to thinking about, if I have to preserve something, what steps do I have to take? And what, is it likely that I'm not gonna lose key information? Um, so oftentimes when we're dealing with you know, getting rid of email, um, when we're dealing with backup tapes and the like, at, that backups the emails, we're talking to the general counsel, we're talking to people and saying, do, you know, is it possible there could be unique information that's relevant in this data source, like a backup tape? The answer is yes. Is it proportionate to keep it? The answer is no. Um, so you can start making those choices, but obviously what that means is someone's got to be willing to make those decisions. And that's probably the most important thing is someone's got to be able to say, there's some risk here, but I'm willing to take that risk. And more and more organizations are doing that. If your organization isn't, I'm telling you're behind because most organizations now, because of all these other risks that we talked about, are starting to get rid of it. And legal has to sort of go along with that um, and start really thinking hard about the choices you have to make. Well, one of, one of the other highlights from the session was the case study, mm -hmm. uh, the case studies that you shared, um, talking about migrating messaging data. Yeah. I, I think the uh, one of the best parts of that was what what was the original plan for the this company for migrating their messages and and why was it that that plan just simply wasn't feasible? Yeah, so I mean, I think a lot of organizations that you know a lot of organizations now are moving to like Microsoft 365 or whatever, and I think it's always important to think about before you start doing the migration and IT starts saying, okay, we're going to just shift and lift and put everything in, it's the exact time we have to start thinking about how do I manage this? Is there a better way? Do I really need to migrate everything? So you might as well clean house before you migrate. And the reason for it is, this is a classic example, we had 3 billion messages in various different archives that we were migrating. And one of the things we realized is that if we did it the way IT was planning to, it would take about nine years to migrate nine, uh, 3 billion messages. So. Based on that, we decided we had to come up with something new. So there we ended up coming up with, and this migration process shows you, we ended up figuring out what is the best way to start doing this. Um, so during the migration itself, we took steps like deduplicating the data, we re-indexed it, deduped it, um, and then figured out what exactly we were gonna migrate. So we only migrated what we actually needed. Um, and that was a lot of effort and it was, cross-functional, we had to talk to the business, we had to talk to records management, we had to talk to lots of different people to figure out what is it that makes sense um, in terms of migrate, what are we comfortable from a risk perspective leaving behind. Um, and it's important to do that and you have to manage the risk, but again, senior management is on board because we cut down the time to about a year and a half um, to migrate the messages by slicing and dicing it and obviously met our goals. Uh, now, now that you've You've, you've done this many times. What yep. advice would you give to the, the folks on this webinar where their companies may be looking to migrate messaging data uh, in the, the coming year or the, the coming months even? Yeah, I, I think the, the answer, as I said, is planning. Um, 
it's all about the vision. There's lots of different ways to migrate data and sort of manage your messaging data. What, we, what you need is someone from the top of the house and lots of people getting in a room together and figuring out what is the vision. What do you want it to look like in two to three years? What technology do you want to implement? Um, that is the most critical thing. You want it all centralized. You probably do. What steps do you have to take to centralize it? So there are a lot of moving pieces, but the most important thing is sitting out and saying, what is the vision? Where do we want to be? What technology do you want to implement? Um, whether it's e-discovery technology or records categorization or whatever you want, if that's your ultimate goal, then you set the course and start making, taking the steps to actually meet that goal in three years or so. That's, that's terrific advice. Thank, thank you, Anthony. Um, really, really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today and uh, sharing, sharing some highlights from, from your session. Sure. Thanks. Uh, our second session from the Innovative Information Governance Track at Legal Tech was called Information Governance in the Cloud, Compare and Contrast, featuring Jeff Beard, Michael Haley, and Carol Stainbrook. Today we have with us Jeff Beard and Michael Haley. Jeff Beard is a legal, privacy, cyber, e-discovery, information governance, and global risk and compliance leader and founder and principal consultant at Jeffrey J. Beard Consulting, Michael Haley is Principal Consultant at Cohasset Associates. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael, in, in your session, uh, you spoke about cloud providers' capabilities in regards to four aspects. Uh, can, can you quickly explain what those four aspects uh, are and why they were uh, the criteria that you uh, had selected to evaluate based on? Sure. The, um, we, act, we were asked to assess some of these uh, cloud storage solution providers, in particular with how they could meet uh, requirements from the SEC, Securities Exchange Commission, as well as FINRA, uh, Financial Regulatory Authority. And, uh, you know, both the SEC and FINRA have very specific requirements for protecting data. And so we were assessing how well each of these cloud providers can meet those requirements in, in four specific areas. The first is immutability, and I'll just read a quick definition from the ISO standards. Uh, immutability is a record that is protected against unauthorized alterations. So that record cannot be uh, annotated, you cannot add to it, you cannot delete it uh, without some explicit indication making it traceable. Those records are immutable, and that's very important. And, um, maybe after I get through these, if Jeff, you want to talk about immutability, you could. But uh, the second aspect we looked at was their ability to retain data, which is just retaining it for the time periods that are specified in the disposition authorities, otherwise known as the retention schedule. We also looked at preservation, which again, according to the ISO standard is defined as the ability to uh, retain records pursuant to any uh, legal or regulatory investigation. So those records cannot be destroyed while the investigation is underway. And the, the last thing that we looked at was uh, what turns out to be most people's favorite is deletion. How do we make sure we dispose of these records when we no longer need them? And that the records systems in place, these cloud storage solutions have to have the ability to support the execution of those disposition actions. So before, before we go on, I don't know, Jeff, did you want to add anything from the legal perspective about the immutability. Well, sure. Well, from the from the legal perspective, you know, beyond you know records and information governance, you know, there's the requirement for for legal matters, especially litigation, to be able to preserve and not have any modification to you know sensitive records and, and things that are relevant to the litigation. So having that ability to uh, have that preservation, to have things that are locked down so you know that they haven't been subject to modification or spoliation as we refer to it litigation, that's very important. And Jeff, I'll, I'll, I'll direct this next question uh, to you. Uh, during the presentation, you use the phrase in the purple. Uh, can, can you explain what that means in this comparison of, of cloud providers? Sure. Okay. So you put the slide up. So if you take a look at kind of the pyramid of your, of your data ranked by, by value, really, the purple, that little triangle at the very top at the peak, that represents the highest value information in your organization, you know, your crown jewels. 
So they need the proper controls and processes to classify, govern, protect, and manage it throughout its entire life cycle. And so the fairly closely aligned with that is the information that's right in blue below that, you know, the, the stuff that is regulated and are needed for legal reasons and obligations. And so when assessing the various cloud providers and capabilities, the highest value information is typically much smaller in overall uh, data volume in your organization, but it has a much higher risk and cost impact if it's not addressed appropriately. So that's kind of that give and take between uh, that the highest value information is ne not necessarily the highest volume. Now, oftentimes it's not, but you have to pay attention to it. And Michael, uh, th these next uh, two slides that we we're, we're presenting from uh, your your overall presentation, um, there's a lot of information in here. Do do you want to walk us through the the cloud storage summary highlights? Sure, um, I'll, I'll, I'll do the best I can. So specifically, we, we looked at uh, the capabilities in, uh, in four, um, four cloud storage providers and the name should be pretty familiar to people, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, Google, and IBM cloud storage. And as we looked at, uh, we looked at these from those four tenets that we talked about before, immutability, retention, um, on this slide we call it legal holds, not preservation as well as disposition. And uh, one of the things that might strike you when you first look at this slide is that, gee, it looks like they can all do all of the same things. And while that is uh, somewhat true, uh, you know, there are, there are differences within, within each of these providers. Um, but for the most part, from an immutability perspective, you see that um, each of the providers, well, I'm sorry, other than IBM Cloud, they have the ability to make a record immutable uh, both during and after the retention or the hold. And it, it can sometimes be important to maintain that immutability after the hold is lifted to make sure that nothing has changed from the time the hold was lifted. So uh, IBM doesn't really provide that, um, that opportunity, but um, you know, let me back up a little bit. The important thing when you're doing these, when you're looking at these, is to make sure that you understand what's right for your company, what you're going to need, and that these these requirements will help um, will help us meet that. So, um, so that's the immutability. The the retention. Uh, you can see that there are some differences in the capabilities of the retention, and. Uh, so everybody can do time-based retention. Time-based retention is pretty simple. You pick the date you want to use, uh, whether it's the date that it was created, the date that it was stored, the date that it was declared a record, whatever date you want to pick. And you say, well, we're legally required to keep this for five years, seven years, 20 years from that date. When that date is up, uh, the this, this system can automatically delete those records um, because they've met the retention. Event-based retention is um, a little bit different and uh, I'm sure many of the people who are listening have struggled with how do you implement event-based retention because it requires human intervention. And both Google and IBM are suggesting that they can do event-based retention and they can, but it's not as simple as putting the words event-based retention on a slide like this and saying we can do event-based retention. Any event-based retention still requires some human intervention to say this event has in fact occurred and therefore the retention can begin based on that date forward. So when they say they have event-based retention, it largely rests on uh, if you, as an example, if you have a contract that has a three-year term, absent any intervention at the end of that three-year term, the retention period will become time-based and, and the clock will start ticking. If you do not want that to happen, then you would have to go in and intervene and say, wait a second, that contract has been renewed, which resets the event-based clock. And I re remember when we were at Legal Tech, uh, Anthony and Therese bef were speaking before us and they were talking about system capabilities, et cetera, and they said something which I think is important, 
which is a little take on the line of, uh, of trust but verify. And the recommendation was don't trust and verify. So if you're, whenever you're looking at any system solution, whether it's cloud provider or whatever, it's a good idea to challenge the stated capabilities of the, of the proposed software. So um, I'll move quickly to uh, legal holds. And the biggest distinction in the legal holds is whether you can, um, you can apply retention at the, or you can apply preservation at the bucket level or the object level. Um, the bucket level, as an example, would be a folder. And the object level would be assigning preservation at the particular documents within that. Um, again, it depends on what's important to you in terms of your really litigation profile within your company. But uh, if you apply preservation at the bucket level, then you will retain everything in that folder or that bucket uh, until such time as the preservation order is lifted. So we use the example of um, Martha Stewart folder. And within a, within a folder called Martha Stewart, you may have subfolders called Martha Stewart trades, Martha Stewart recipes. Presumably at the time of the litigation, you were less interested in Martha Stewart's recipes, but you might have been interested in preserving Martha Stewart's trades. If you're preserving at the object level, you can go down and just preserve those things that would be related to Martha Stewart trades. Uh, if you stay at the bucket level, you're keeping anything and everything that's in that Martha Stewart folder. Right. So just, just to add a point here is that it, it all depends on you know, what your strategy is for the preservation for the litigation. If you're looking to preserve more broadly, you might want to take a look at you know, bucket level or container level preservation, but understand what's in it first, because it could be very, very, very broad or overbroad, and you could be preserving a lot of additional information. So it's helpful to understand what's in there first. Uh, you definitely don't want to have things uh, expire, be modified unintentionally if they're you know, uh, relevant to litigation. So that's why it's just good to have an understanding of what, what these features are, what your approach is, and working with your legal team to understand you know, what and how things need to be preserved so that uh, you're, getting, you're, you're hitting that right balance of proportionality of preserving what you need to, but not necessarily over-preserving a lot of additional data, which can, can cost you a lot of other costs and, and issues down the road. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. And then uh, the final column on here is disposition, which is again just tied to the life cycle action, the you know life cycle of uh, of information as it goes through uh, create, retain, preserve, uh, and and it's tied to the life cycle action. Um, I, I should say before we even move on that uh, you know we we worked hard to condense all of this information into a one hour presentation. And now I'm working hard to condense it into a less than 15 minute presentation. So uh, this is really kind of a high level overview. And uh, it, if anybody's interested, we could certainly talk more specifically about any of these aspects, but I think we need to move on. Well, I, I have one. <laughs> well we're, it, it's, it provides an interesting segue, your discussion on legal holds for the session that comes after this uh, on the, the California Consumer Privacy Act. We, we have preservation at the bucket level and you use the Martha, Martha Stewart example. If one of the folders was Martha Stewart PII, <laughs> you were preserving at the bucket level, you could, you could run into some, some privacy issues there. As, as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so we, have, we might have some competing, competing uh, advice when it comes to, to bucket level preservation on what's, what becomes more important to the organization. Exactly right. Um, uh, Jeff and Michael, I'll, I'll address this one to, to both of you because you, uh, a, a lot of information in these slides here, and I'm, I'm so thankful that you're, you're condensing into such a, a short format, but you also gave us a bonus when we were in the hour long version um, of insights about cloud collaboration providers. Um, I, I hate to ask it, but could you also provide us some high level insights here as well? <laughs> Well, I would say that, you know, it, with the collaboration, oftentimes that's referred to as uh, kind of sync and share. That's one, that's one way it's referred to. It's, 
a, a, it's related but a little bit different because this is where people are you know working on live documents collaborating you've got different versions lot you know think of you know your sales or marketing team working on various versions of a presentation for example uh, you're going to have a lot of that going on and so it's helpful to understand how they manage versions, how you can manage access and controls, uh, retention and disposition and so forth. And I'll, I'll let Mike chime in on, on you know, any other comments he has. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't have a lot to add, but you're right. The, uh, you know, the collaboration space uh, kind of takes on a, a different tone because there is often the, the back and forth. Sometimes there is the check-in, the check-out. Uh, you know, when, when do you need to make something immutable? When do you need to make sure you uh, turn off the deletion of prior versions? And um, so, you know, collaboration is, is a fabulous thing. And it's like a lot of, you know, the best thing in the world is email. The worst thing in the world is email. Um, you, can apply, you can apply legal holds on all of these things. Um, whether, you know, you're using Office 365, and I think somebody mentioned Office 365 earlier, um, which is certainly um, a hot topic, people migrating to Office 365. Uh, they are building in a lot of additional capabilities. Certainly, you can automate this position. Uh, you can apply legal holds at a, a number of different levels within Office 365. Um, and, and, and also, I mean, Box and, and G Suite. They mm -hmm. These offer a lot of very similar capabilities. Uh, it's again, what kind of what works best for your organization. I know uh, Box has a few um, features that uh, enable some of the outside access uh, without, you know, outside your organization, which makes a little bit, often a little bit easier than um, Office 365. But um, I, I don't have a whole lot um, on, I don't really have a whole lot more to offer on collaboration. I think it's a question of kind of what fits within your organization. Fair. Well, thank you. Thank you both, Jeff, Michael. Uh, again, thank you so much for sharing and uh, condensing an hour into a, a, a shortened time frame here. It's very, very appreciated. Thank um, you. Thank you. Our, our next session from the Innovative Information Governance Track at Legal Tech featured uh, a familiar face, Jeff Beard, uh, as well as John Asaza. And it was called the 2018 California Consumer Privacy Act, the big tail wagging the US. John Asaza is a partner at Ramon Law and is head of the, their information governance and RIM practice where he's an advisor to Fortune 500 companies as well as startups. Jeff uh, Beard, to reiterate, is a legal privacy, cyber e-discovery, information governance and global risk and compliance leader and founder and principal consultant of Jeffrey Beard Consulting. So let's start with, with the high level here uh, because there's a lot to unpack in this, uh, the CCPA. At, at a high level, Jeff, uh, what is the CCPA? Sure, so if you think about it, it's really the first, you know, first attempt at a comprehensive consumer data privacy law here in the US. I mean, we've got data privacy in various silos in financial and healthcare uh, with various laws. Uh, California really tried to address it across the board around consumer data privacy. And it's significant because you think about it, uh, we don't have something like that in this country right now. The other part is that California is a significant uh, demographic. I mean, it is the fifth largest economy in, United, in the world actually. And there's about 40 million people. So that covers a lot of people. So you've got businesses across the U.S. and beyond uh, that, that, are, that have their data and, and fall under the applicability requirements. They're going to be impacted by this as well. And there's, there's an interesting story that you shared about how the CCPA even happened. Well, you know, you know most, most legislation takes years to come to fruition. Right. Uh, how long did the CCPA take? You know, it was really uh, probably about a year or less. Uh, so there was a gentleman in California, Alistair McTaggart, who ran his family real estate business. And that's really how these, this got started. He was having drinks with a Google engineer friend and, you know, essentially became very concerned by how much data the, the big tech companies were collecting. I mean, he was expecting his friend to say, you know, kind of like the pilot on the airline, everything's fine. Don't worry about we're coming in for a nice landing. And once he found out how much data was really being collected, he, he kind of freaked out about it. 
So he pulled together a team in mid to late 2017 to try to address these growing privacy problems. And we were seeing them in the news all the time. You know, the Cambridge Analytica, uh, uh, you know, data breach, regular data breaches we've seen across the board, some of the mega ones. And it got to the level of a voter referendum. Now, the problem was that for the California legislatures, once the voters approved McTaggart's initiative, then the lawmakers would need to muster an almost unobtainable supermajority to amend it. So basically, it was off to the races for them to draft their own data privacy law and pass it so then they could have the further control over it uh, for amending it. And actually, it's been amended once already, and there's further rules and regulations that are supposed to be coming from the California uh, AG's office. If I, may add, if, I, if I may add to that, uh, an interesting uh, sort of consequence of what Jeff just mentioned um, was number one that the that the proposed referendum was actually even broader and more restrictive than the regulations that that actually wound up being enacted, but even more dramatically, uh, the the, reg the legislation itself that wound up passing was drafted within 72 hours. So you can only imagine um, what little thought was actually put into consequences of these laws. So as a result of that, there, there, we expect an actually an onslaught of revisions, if not litigation, <laughs> resulting from the vagaries that came out of, of uh, the, the eventual legislation that, that was passed. And John, that, that provides a nice segue here. What, what exactly does the CCPA require from, from businesses? Oh, right. Okay. I believe I may have a slide on that. Uh, let's see if the next one is on there. Yeah, so it applies to um, for-profit entities that both collect and process personal information. Um, but what the, what the legislators did was they tried to carve out um, an, an exception to protect small to medium-sized businesses by basically saying, okay, you don't have to comply with the CCPA if you're uh, generate... Uh, if only if you generate an annual gross revenue in excess of 25 million, or if you receive uh, share or share personal information of more than 50,000 California residents, or the business derives at least 50% of its annual revenue by selling the information of California residents. So easily, you know, nonprofit businesses and government entities are easy to carve out. Unfortunately, the consequence of this is that that second requirement of collecting uh, 50, you know, the information of 50,000 California residents annually um, could happen very easily, um, even if you are not um, targeting them just through website, website traffic alone, uh, particularly if you're in a B2C business, you could easily reach within a year that 50,000 uh, person mark. And then um, uh, secondly, your, your business, uh, uh, could could wind up uh, uh, easily, you know, exceeding the the 25 million in, in revenue again, depending on on the critical mass on a given year. Uh, so again, that's uh, these are things that that to be mindful of. Now, in terms of your question of what specifically is required of them, um, there's there is actually a lot more than than we could possibly say in a matter of just a couple of minutes. But um, at the at the highest level. Um, and this is from, a, from a, an article that I just finished writing. Uh, the organization has to track consumer information uh, from collection through sale or, or deletion of the information, um, create a system to promptly respond uh, to consumer requests to delete their information. Um, and there have to be at least two different systems uh, to, for receiving consumer requests. So you have to have a, maybe a website link and maybe a, a direct email to whom the information can be, can be sent. Um, but when you receive these requests, the information has to be verified as actually coming from the actual consumer, which is actually the question of verification is actually up for grabs. They don't really know what this means. And if you inadvertently wind up communicating with the consumer that didn't out to, turn out to be the actual consumer that was verified, you could be in a breach there in itself. Um, and in addition to that, your privacy notices um, now have to describe the consumer right, consumer's rights and how to exercise them and provide a list of the categories of personal information that's collected 
sold and disclosed in the prior 12 months, and that has to be updated. Um, it has to have a link to a do not sell my personal information page, a listing of categories of third parties who will receive the personal information, including the identification of financial incentives offered by the businesses. And then finally, there's an anti-discrimination rule that basically says that if you as a consumer opt out of, of providing the information, which is something you have to give the consumer the right to do, you uh, cannot discriminate against them in providing your services. You still have to provide um, uh, the services to them. So again, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very tricky set of, of waters to navigate to be uh, mindful of this. And then of course, ultimately, there's the right to be forgotten, which is where the consumer has the right to basically request that you delete their information, which means that you then have to be tracking what kind of information um, is, it could potentially be considered personal information that has to be removed. And, and we have a question here on how consumer is defined. And this was a similar question that uh, you actually received in New York for Legal Tech. If you're a B2B, business to business company, does CCPA apply? That's, that's right. Yeah, the, the, the definition of consumer is actually a, a very broad definition. Um, and it is broad enough to include employees of the company. Um, and just basically, it's any um, California, obviously a California resident, uh, but um, it could be somebody that's temporarily living in California or by extension, somebody that has left temporarily uh, out of California, um, but still a, considered a California resident. So there's many tentacles to how it is and then how we track this information and, and what's considered a consumer, who's considered a consumer, who's not, that kind of thing. So I think that to try to draw the distinction, you just, you're just gonna have to assume that anybody's data that you retain and even the data of your employees uh, is needs to be subject to it. And I think really what we can extrapolate from this, and this is a little bit looking forward to what Jeff is gonna conclude with, is that we are dealing with the US, uh, with the, the tail of, you know, California tail wagging the US, right? Because right now California is the high water mark, okay? So you, you might as well, you're gonna be going through the trouble of, of revisiting your privacy policies and all that stuff you might as well set it for the high water mark because it's just a matter of time before all the other states head in that direction. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I'm having, <laughs> having deja vu. I feel like we just did this with the, the EU GDPR. Um, it, it feels like a lot of these same, uh, same things that we were asking questions about in the lead up to, to the implementation of GDPR, we're, we're gonna be asking a lot of the same questions about CCPA. So uh, I, what, what are the, the, the key differences between GDPR and CCPA? We, if you're already complying with GDPR, should CCPA already be taken care of or? Yeah, that's a good question. That's what the next slide is. And uh, you know what, uh, this is probably one of my favorite slides that I have uh, come across. Uh, uh, over the last uh, year or so, you know, Jeff and I did our valiant effort. We put together a bunch of charts and all that stuff, but this one actually really encapsulates the distinctions um, and the similarities between CCPA and GDPR. So in the, in the middle, you have with the commonalities between CCPA and GDPR, training requirements, notice, consent, access and portability, uh, erasure of data, the right to object, uh, um, and encryption and redaction of personal information. But on the GDPR side, you'll notice that there's these additional sort of broader requirements um, which, which they have in, in, in common, not specifically um, uh, with, through CCPA, but for example, there's a mandatory breach notification which is already covered under other laws. So in reality, California's privacy package is, has that in common with GDPR. Uh, data protection impact assessments, um, governance specific requirements, and probably the biggest, the, the biggest distinguisher is that GDPR requires you to have a data protection officer designated as part of the organization, uh, in addition to all the other requirements that you see on the screen. 
On the far right of this, then you see the additional requirements that CCPA imposes that GDPR doesn't, which is the right to limit the sale of personal information, and that's huge, and the um, inability to discriminate uh, the services or products provided based on opting out, which was what I talked about earlier, that basically you can't, you, you can't uh, say to somebody, I'm not going to provide the services to you just because you've exercised your privacy rights. Right. Right, which is going to be interesting if you think of all the, the, the services that you basically get for free, uh, either on your phone or through, you know, through the internet, where you have to, basically what you're paying them is, is in your personal data. And so if you tell them you're, you're opting out and the law says they can't discriminate, that's going to be interesting because that's going to impact a lot of those tech companies' business models as well. So that, I'm waiting to see how, how that's going to impact it. Um, regarding this, you know, this overlay, if you think about it, you know, the, the similarities and the differences, I'm just going to add three, three quick points. One, the CCPA is much broader in allowing the collection of, of PI, personal information, because with the GDPR, you've got like the six legal bases that you have to meet, uh, one, at least meet one of them to start collecting the data. CCPA has basically no prohibition against the collection of PI. It's what happens afterwards. Uh, also, if the of a business that's subject to the CCPA receives a delete request, like say I you know I want to have the right to be forgotten, delete my information, they must also direct any service providers to delete the the consumer's PI from their records as well. So it kind of all flows down. Uh, so that raises the question of you know. Um, you know, I would probably want to revisit any agreements with those providers to just see how that's handled. And, you know, the other thing is the CCPA readiness must include any uh, the ability to fulfill data requests going backward 12 months from the data request. So you have to be ready to be able to provide that information to a consumer that's asking for it. Uh, and so you've got to be ready kind of before, before even the go live date. Yeah. Wow, that's, there's a lot there. Um, so let's 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 run a hypothetical. Let's say that I'm I'm a company that should be complying soon with CCPA. What should I be looking at for for preparation? So really, so really, it's it's assessing. You know, you may have gone through to some extent already with GDPR, but it's really determining what your exact regulatory and legal environment is. What's your, you know, your risk and risk appetite related to this? Because, you know, with any of these uh, compliance situations, uh, there, you know, you have to prioritize what do we need to do first, second, third that we haven't done already for GDPR, and how does that tie to our business goals and make some educated and some business decisions around that. And oftentimes, uh, you have to figure out, you know, uh, we, boy, we really need to focus on this area or this process first because we know that's going to be a problem or if, if we don't, if we're not compliant, what's that going to do to our business uh, or to our customers uh, and also uh, the whole thing around reputational risk uh, as well. So, and, and then the last point on the slide, it really looking at the maturity of all of those programs to make sure that you know you're you're not at a level one maturity. You're really trying to get up to you know a much higher level of maturity. And uh, have you done a lot of that work already for GDPR? Great, uh, leverage that and those teams. Uh, I will say this: uh, information governance and privacy. It's a team sport. You're you're not going to be able to solve it in your own si silo alone. You need to reach across legal, privacy, compliance, IT, records, and and the business units as well. Yeah, I, I think that, the, you know, it's a couple of things jump out at me just in, in overall from what we've been discussing in the last uh, 10 minutes or so. And that is, number one, you really need to give some serious consideration to um, in what kind of a product you're going to, if you're in a B2C type of, type of situation, what kind of a product are you going to be offering and how is it going to affect your offering if you have a consumer who opts out? Of, of providing you all the data. Um, the other big picture thing that you need to do is you uh, need to take a nice, long, hard look at your, at your privacy policy um, and obviously the processes that are, that are related to it, um, again, in terms of immediate steps, uh, because you may have revised it for GDPR, but it may actually need further revisions depending on what you're offering depending on your geographic footprint and your exposure to California. Um, because one of the distinguishing factor between GDPR and CCPA is that GDPR has a really massive um, uh, 
uh, penalty for non-compliance, which is up to 4% of your global gross revenue. So for huge companies, that's huge. For smaller companies, you're, you know, that, you know, that could be their entire, you know, profit margin, right? Uh, but in California, you know, the, 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 the um, consequences are like $750 per uh, occurrence per individual. And you're saying, okay, well, that's not that bad. For 50,000 uh, consumers, that's $37,500,000. $37, that alone, so for a small to medium-sized company, that's, those consequences are huge. So you need to be really looking long and hard. And then also the unintended consequence of how you might be collecting information from California consumers just by virtue of, say, having a website alone. <clears throat> uh, and then you see on the slides everything that, you know, everything else that we've sort of been, you know, building, at, you know, putting in, you know, recommending. Uh, the opt-out link is, we mentioned now. Uh, in addition to that, that's interesting. You see here that you're like, wait a minute, if you have opt-out link, why do I also need an opt-in link, which I think Nick was one of your questions at the conference. Um, the opt-in link is actually necessary for the data of minors, to collect data of minors. So you actually have to have a parent opt in your minor to be able to collect their data. So that's an additional uh, requirement that you, that you need to be putting into the system. Um, and then of course, the procedures for handling and responding to requests, and then uh, you know, the overall uh, assessment of your security, privacy, and, and IG programs, um, and just determining your overall uh, compliance readiness. Mm -hmm. there's, there's so much information here in terms of readiness and preparedness. Um, let's, I, I'm enjoying the hypothetical here. So Jeff, what, what do you think the future will look like if and when there's you know, a, a federal privacy legislation or God forbid other states jump on this bandwagon and create their own privacy legislation with different requirements can and you paint a picture for us on where uh, this might all go next. Right. Well, there's been a lot of dialogue in the country around this, both at the federal and state level. There's, uh, there's been talk about having, you know, uh, one federal level data, data privacy law. Um, you've got the tech companies weighing in on one end of what they like to see in it. You've got the privacy advocates coming at it from a different angle and there's some overlap and there's also some distance between them. Uh, you know, the question if there's a federal law uh, comes out, will it preempt or not to preempt? Businesses generally probably would want that because they would prefer to have just one rule to comply with uh, rather than, uh, you know, potentially up to 50 different states. The, the challenge is, I think, is that the state legislatures have proven themselves to be more nimble in moving this forward. And we've seen, you know, we've seen that with a number of different cybersecurity laws across different states that have uh, so, uh, some similar and yet some different requirements that now companies have to comply with that patchwork. Uh, that could very well happen on, uh, at the state level for the privacy uh, laws as well. Um, our federal government right now hasn't proven itself to be too nimble. So, there's a chance, there's you know, probably a good chance that you might see more privacy laws coming up at the state level that companies are going to have to comply with. And whether or not the federal, the federal law, if it is passed, will it preempt or not. And so that's, that's kind of the quagmire that everybody's navigating right now. And I think, I think, that's, a, I think that's a valid uh, prediction because just what we're seeing so far. Jeff, John, thank yeah. you. Thank you both so much for uh, very quickly going through what is some some incredibly complex uh, an incredibly complex complex topic with uh, lots of tentacles that uh, will affect a lot of lot of organizations. Um, I, I want to take a chance just to thank all of our incredible speakers for today's webinar, um, and, and thank you for continuing to serve the community by sharing your knowledge both virtually, like today and in person at Legal Tech and the ARMA conference. Uh, each of these three sessions has been pre-recorded in their full length form and are being made available by ARMA. We'll be following up with every attendee with links and information on how to access those pre-recorded sessions if you'd like a deeper dive on any of these three topics that we discussed today. So keep an eye on your email, uh, it should be tomorrow for those links. Uh, our next webinar that we have coming up 
is a webinar that's exclusively for our professional members. It's a part of our ongoing iMasters series featuring the brilliant Kevin Parker, and we'll be talking about why information architecture is vital to information governance. Uh, this webinar is gonna be packed with useful knowledge that every information professional should know. Uh, before we close, as promised, I'd like to remind you to become a professional member of ARMA International, take the time to invest in yourself, and while you're at it, you can pre-register for the ARMA conference in Nashville this October, or submit your proposal to speak and share your knowledge, share what's happening in, in your company, in your experience, or become a volunteer to help us shape the conference. Uh, ARMA has an array of resources that are available to you, uh, from our white papers to our trainings and, and our magazine, which is featured here. Uh, in our magazine right now, you can read about John Asaza, who was uh, kind enough to join us today, uh, his thoughts on the recent Illinois Supreme Court opinion on biometric data, as well as my insights from the opening keynote of Legal Tech featuring former attorneys general of the United States, Alberto Gonzalez and Loretta Lynch, and a, a ton of other uh, incredible pieces that, that are, are coming out regularly at magazine.arma.org. It's the continuation of 50 years of the information management magazine, all at magazine.arma.org. On behalf of our speakers and all of us at Arma International, I want to thank you for joining us for today's webinar and wish you the best in all of your information endeavors. I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thanks, Nick. Thank you.